by Public Safety and headed by Director Randy Kreider. Good afternoon, Chairwoman, Commissioners, uh, County Manager. Um, Public Safety is here to present uh, our budget uh, request for FY 23 and 24. I will start us out by giving us an overview of uh, a few comments about all of our public safety departments and then specifically to the uh, roles that come directly out of my office and then we will allow each department head to go through uh, their budget uh, request individually. So we'll look at our, our mission statement. I'm not going to read that uh, word for word. Um, it kind of speaks for itself. Uh, all in all, we try to make every effort to provide the best uh, services to our citizens from each of our departments. And I won't uh, read that uh, mission statement word for word. Looking at our challenges and opportunities, uh, kind of overarching, uh, very similar needs through all of our departments and a lot of the same needs that you've heard uh, up until now with all the presentations from all of our departments. <coughs> And the first one being hiring and retention of staff. And uh, just to give you an idea, public safety in Cobb, not, not including the sheriff's office, we have a, just under 1,800 employees. About 600 of those employees throughout public safety are civilian, non-sworn employees. And so um, we, along with the other non-sworn uh, departments throughout the county, uh, face some of the similar challenges that, that each other face. And before I go any further, first of all, I just want to say thank you to all of you in the past who have truly placed public safety a priority. We acknowledge that publicly, and we're very appreciative of that. Uh, but however, we still have some needs that we want to talk about today. So hiring and retention of all of our personnel, not just sworn. Uh, in fact, in many areas, we have trouble recruiting and hiring and retaining a lot of our administrative uh, folks. And so that's one challenge that uh, you'll see as we go, go through this. And hopefully our pay and class study will reveal some of those uh, remedies, if you will, or, or provide some suggestions of how we can remedy some of those challenges. But also budget constraints impe impedes our progression and growth. And one of the things that I have noticed over the recent past is the development both professionally and personally of our staff. Because we're so short staffed, we, we can't allow time for our people to go get training that they need to better prepare them for, for their uh, future, uh, better situate them for promotions as those become available. And so if we can uh, deal with, if we can address our hiring and retention, I think then that would allow us to have enough staff to where we could cover everything while other staff were, were in training. And then uh, additional positions are necessary to meet the demands of programs and services. Obviously in public safety, uh, our services are very dynamic in how we deliver those. And um, there are a lot of new programs and services that, matter of fact, some of you have brought to our attention and recommendations that uh, we would really like to, to be involved in that. But it's one of those things where you're helping Rob from Peter to pay Paul and moving people around through uh, to different apartments just uh, to, to meet the needs that, that we have on the surface. And then strategic planning is difficult without a commitment of capital funds for replacement and new requests. And I think most all of you are aware that uh, we do not budget currently for capital. And uh, I think that's designed that way to allow some more flexibility with our, with our capital funds. But as a result of that, my opinion is that we're make, not making a firm commitment uh, as a county uh, by not funding our capital projects. And that's why I think you see a lot of the deterioration of some of our facilities, uh, our vehicles that uh, uh, throughout the county that uh, need, some of them need to be replaced. So uh, funding our capital moving forward would be very, very important. So the next slide, uh, basically, uh, and if you look at, at the bottom of this slide, as I go through this slide, we're only gonna be talking about when we talk about DPS in my office, internal affairs, facility maintenance, our supply unit, and then the public safety departments, police, police training, animal services, 800 megahertz and EMA. All of those are the departments that are included in the general fund. 
And I want to point out something that, that a lot of people don't know. Our 800 megahertz is in the general fund. Our E911 operations have their own fund. And so you will see uh, Director Alterio do two separate presentations today. She will do one for 800 megahertz because it's in the general fund. And then she'll come back at the end to do a 911 department uh, budget presentation at the end. So as we go through this, uh, and just by the way, we're gonna, we're gonna hit this very high level. All of you will be getting a copy of this presentation and the justification that will come with all of these requests. And we will be scheduling sit down meetings, maybe two of you at a time, uh, maybe cases where we'd have to do just one commissioner. And we'll bring all five of our department heads to come in and talk about some of the questions that you may have in detail. So you will, you will get these presentations hard copy uh, or uh, digitally on your computer. So looking at uh, talking about just the general fund budget, okay? These are the departments at the bottom that are included in the general fund. In all of those departments or all of those units, you can see an increase for personnel costs from 22 to 23, going from 83,000 to 90, I mean 83 million to 92 million, which uh, is roughly $6 million increase um, overall. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Out of the, yes ma'am. No, it's not. What's that? It's bigger than that, 83 to 92. Yes. Are you talking about between 77 and 83? Yes, no, oh, between okay. 83 and 92. Okay. I'll take your word for it, but. Eight million. Okay. 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 And, and it actually has it there, 8.4 million. Okay. That's, that's the increase. <laughs> <laughs> my McEacher math didn't pay off, Cheryl. <laughs> but hey, anyway, my sorry, youth, Bridget. My, my youth I mean, sorry, goes sorry, Deidre. Uh, no, don't do it. Sorry, Deidre, I apologize. But anyway, um, this is the side. Then going into the, the personnel budget, for all of those departments that I just mentioned, uh, we have an additional 51 positions that we're gonna request. As I'm going through this presentation, we will uh, divide those 51 by department and where they fall. So that's the uh, a breakdown of the personnel budget. Okay, go ahead. From my office, Internal Affairs, Supply, and Facilities Maintenance, we're asking for six new positions. Okay, that's six of the 51, all right? Go ahead to the next page and we'll, here's those positions uh, that were requested, those six that were requesting. The first one is not actually a new position request, it's just an upgrade of a part-time to a full-time uh, communications person with NDPS to help with the, uh, uh, communication needs for public safety. The next next uh, column is two positions in our maintenance unit, facilities maintenance unit. One of those will be dedicated to the police new police training center, and one will be dedicated to the fire training center once we do the renovations there. So that's the two new positions in facility maintenance. <clears throat> the supply unit, and when I say supply unit, those people provide all the supplies, uniforms, and everything to all of our public safety uh, personnel, some 1,800 personnel. And we're asking for two additional positions at our supply unit just because of the increased workload and the goods that we order uh, to be distributed. All of our supplies for fire and EMS, uh, uh, all your EMS supplies, all of that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're looking at uh, hiring two additional HR reps that would service, continue to service all of those departments, all of those 1,800 people. Uh, and I don't know, uh, I know Tony recognizes this, the demand for uh, our HR administrative needs, specifically through COVID and tracking people who were gonna be out. It, it was very overwhelming. Uh, and doing chronos and all of those things for all of public safety, uh, we could use two other additional staff in in my office on the fourth floor. Next slide, Do you slide, have please. HR staff today? Ma'am? Do you have HR staff today? Yes, we have two. Okay. We have two today. All right, the, op the operating budget for uh, just my office, internal affairs, supply, and facility maintenance, uh, as you can see, uh, is increasing from 92,000 to 177,000 on uh, operating budget increase. Next slide. Those are our operating line items. 
those are some that we can go through uh, later if you guys have uh, questions. Next slide. And then, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, we have never funded, uh, I don't say never, but in the recent past, we have not funded our capital budget requests. And that's why you're seeing zero in FY21 and 22. For FY23, we're asking for 650,000, and we'll talk about what those capital needs are first. Across from our current fire headquarters is our supply facility, which used to be our old fire headquarters facility. And we went in and kind of gutted that uh, back in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, then we, uh, when we, we just gutted it and moved our supply into that building. Obviously, it doesn't have a loading dock because it's never been retrofitted to meet the needs that we currently have. So a part of that $650,000, as you can see in the third picture from left to right, the trucks actually park out in the parking lot. We drive out in the parking lot with a forklift, get them the goods, bring them into the, to the warehouse, and that's how we get them in, inside the warehouse, which is destroyed the parking lot. So that's part of this renovation. Um, also, the space, uh, we're gonna better design the space uh, than what it is now. Like I said, right now, it's just a basically an open warehouse, and we're gonna go in there and do a, a renovation of that facility as well. Next slide. Here's part of the, um, the capital uh, spelled out, what I just basically told you. Uh, the, we need a truck and van for the two uh, positions that we ask for for our facilities maintenance uh, personnel. Um, we're going to, right now, and RISC has, uh, has worked with us on eliminating extension ladders that we currently use and step ladders that we currently use in our supply warehouse. Uh, and we want to purchase a scissor lift that would uh, allow our people to, to stack our goods up and not use extension ladders and, and uh, step ladders because of safety reasons. And uh, then you see the bottom two, that's the uh, loading dock, uh, creation of a load, loading dock and resurfacing the parking lot at this facility. Next slide. All right, Shanna is not feeling well today and so I'm gonna do her portion uh, of the presentation for animal services. Uh, Animal Services' mission is that uh, they're there to enforce state law and county ordinances pertaining to animal control and management, educating the community on responsible pet ownership and wildlife care and provide housing and care for homeless animals while coordinating their adoptions when possible and humane euthanization when adoptions are not possible. And we try our best, and I think you all know that we try our best to minimize or eliminate euthanasia. Uh, and so with that, uh, next slide. So the overarching challenge is aging and outdated facility. We all know that this is a 2022 SPLOST project is to build a new animal services facility. So that, uh, that need will be met using SPLOST uh, funds. Um, we also want to uh, maintain biosecurity and follow guidelines and standards that are, are laid out for animal shelters. And then until we can Obviously, we know that we're understaffed there, and we know that it takes time to hire people, train them, and get them on the job. So these overtime, increase in overtime requests is to get us to the point to where we can hire full-time staff. And the need for those overtime hours will no longer exist because we are understaffed and our current employees are having to work overtime to meet the needs of the department. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Um, I thought we had a, a new animal shelter on the 2022 SPLOST. We do. I, that was first bullet. He mentioned it. Okay. I didn't hear you. <laughs> well, I'm reading, and it doesn't say that. Yes, Commissioner. Yes, ma'am. And I know you're talking about staffing and being understaffed. Are you still utilizing volunteers? Absolutely. As many right. as we can get. Okay. As many as we oh, can. I wasn't sure because with COVID and everything, if we've transitioned back to having volunteers back in working with animal services or not. We, we are, but we continued the appointment process that we uh, put in place when COVID uh, hit because we're, we can better management, manage that because we are understaffed and knowing when people are coming to adopt an animal uh, gives us the opportunity to make sure that staff is there when those schedules are made. 
And so we continued that actually because it's, it's working very well. Um, so the increased overtime request that we here, he, have here could go away if we could be full, get fully staffed, but we know that's gonna take time. Are you gonna give us some numbers or can you share with us some numbers relatively? How many people do they have now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got a, I've got a slide that's gonna, that's gonna address that. Thank you. And then obviously the new facility will improve services and that, that's just gonna be a win. And so once we get the new facility built, we'll, we'll be able to really enhance our services that we currently provide and even some services that we don't currently provide. Next slide. So the, the general fund uh, request, uh, you can see that uh, it's jumping from, uh, operating uh, request is jumping from 557 in 22 to 720 in uh, 23. And this next slide will outline part of that. Um, the new positions, here you go, uh, uh, Chairwoman, we're asking for four additional positions for animal services and they are, next, two, Animal Control Officer Ones, one Administrative Specialist, and one additional Vet Tech Supervisor. Please understand, and in a minute on our operating, you will see an increase in vet supplies. Please understand that we not only provide vet services to those animals that we take in, but we also provide it for our canines. We also provide it for the Sheriff's canines, and so they take care of all of those animals there at the animal shelter. Okay, next. The uh, operating, uh, that's a, uh, as you can see, is an increase of 163,000 um, from 22 to 23. Next slide. Those are the uh, operating costs. You can see an increased usage of veterinary supplies, uh, that 146,978. That's a detailed, just a detailed list of our operating increases that uh, we're presenting. Next slide. Capital, uh, for only for two of those uh, personnel requests, we would need a vehicle. Uh, we also are looking to, and police will have this in their budget, we currently have one animal cruelty officer uh, at Animal Services, and y'all know what happens when you only have one of something, uh, that I call that the bus plan. What happens if this person gets run over by a bus? Mm -hmm. uh, and in that critical role that this animal cruelty officer plays, it's important and our case level uh, increases, is increasing. Yeah. And so uh, police will be asking for an additional position that will be our second animal cruelty officer and this, this truck in this slide is for that person. The other, the, the other van is to replace or to add to their fleet that they have now. Next slide. All right, so that does it for those departments uh, that I directly oversee in my office, supply, facilities, maintenance, and then I present it to the Animal Service. So we'll get Cassie to come up now and present the request from okay. EMA. Good afternoon, thank you so much for having us and, and supporting us in all the ways that you do. Um, we are emergency, or I'm emergency management, and our mission statement is to provide countywide emergency management program leadership, continuity, and direction to enable Cobb County and its partners to prepare for, respond to, recover from, and mitigate the impact of natural man-made or technolo technological disasters upon its people or property. And as you know, the past year and a half, we've been pretty busy doing that, so uh, next slide. Some of our challenges, uh, the budget constraints on our uh, enhancing the outdoor weather siren system, uh, increasing the technology cost to maintain our emergency operations center, and an additional position as necessary to, to, meet, the, to meet the demands of the programs and services that we have. So as you can see, I'm asking for an additional 79,000 for personnel. Operating is an additional about 105,000. So if you can go to the next slide. I'm asking for a deputy director as much as I love the role that I have, it would be amazing to have someone help share that responsibility. Um, so, it, you know, being a single point of contact is difficult. So to, to uh, have that continuity and to keep things going well in our office, I think it'd be a, a fantastic fit to have that, especially as these events keep just happening over and over. We have severe weather, we have had COVID. Uh, it would have been very beneficial to have had that uh, as we went through those things. So. 
uh, looking forward to that possibility. It is important to say that uh, we do have a lab labor distribution where we have 33.3% that comes from the fire fund, 33.3 uh, out of E911, and then 33.3 out of the general fund. Next. So looking at our operating request, I'll hit the high points. Um, the majority of this would be for our annual maintenance and support contracts um, in order to keep our video wall uh, going, this, the software for that is an additional increase of $30,000. And we also have an additional 29,000 requested uh, on preventative maintenance for the 74 weather sirens. As you know, we had one recently that was sounding on the weekend and that's not ideal. So what this would do would allow us to go in and have those batteries checked to make sure that they are updated before that problem happens. And then we also have an additional request for uh, siren parts. The vendor that we use does come out of uh, Anniston, Alabama. So having those things readily available here will make those repairs a lot faster. Okay. And in order to uh, have the deputy director position, we'd also need a capital budget of 45,000 uh, for a vehicle. And that's it, any questions for me? Yes. and. Um Help us understand how many people do you have on staff now? Including me, I have five. So four, four on my team. Yeah. And we do use volunteers and, and thankful for that because we have those damage assessment volunteers, we have a search and rescue team, we have EOC support that can help us and, and we work really hard to keep those relationships going so that we have that extra staff when we need it. Yeah, thank you. Any other okay. questions? Thank you, Cassie, thank you. appreciate it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you again for the opportunity to come and speak. I'm excited. It's my first time presenting the budget before you all. So thank you. As Director Kreider said, I'm going to be talking um, two times today. Um, the first about the division of 800 megahertz, which is a, a division within the Department of Emergency Communications. And our mission statement there is to provide effective interoperable radio communications between all first responder personnel. Cobb County agencies, municipal agencies, and our public safety partners. And I will say this, if you did not know, our 800 megahertz radio system is the largest radio system in the state of Georgia, um, quite often esteemed by other radio system users, um, and we are definitely, definitely up there top notch. So, so our request, our total request is going to be an increase of $1,072,390. Um, so our first proposed FY23 personnel request is going to be a, an increase of $198,509 for a total of $571,462. Our second um, request, our operating for FY23, is uh, $2,439,598, which is a $673,881 increase. And we have a one-time capital in FY23 of $200,000. I'll go ahead and explain um, through the next slides. So we do have a uh, personnel request. We are requesting two additional personnel for the 800 megahertz division. Currently we have our radio systems administrator and he has two individuals right now. There is no real span of control other than the radio system administrator and his two radio system specialists. So we are requesting a senior radio system specialist at 101,527, HR did review that job description and signed off on it. And we're requesting an additional radio system specialist um, to help offset the, the workload, to keep up with the demands of a growing radio system, and also to provide the 20, continue to provide 24 seven support for our over 11,000 users. Melissa, can you yes. just help to provide some clarification as to what your specialists do? This is probably one of the first presentations we've had from sure, this department, sure. and I know we have a lot of agenda <laughs> items for the actual equipment, but I'm less yes. familiar with what the staff is. I sure can. So our uh, radio systems administrator has actually given us the luxury of breaking down all of their tasks, which I will have for you in our one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, but just to give you some idea, we do radio programming. Uh, we have to do updates like firmware updates, for instance. We troubleshoot and radio maintenance repairs and operations. Um, we do template, radio template events, a lot of, a lot of technical talk, I okay. understand, but radio template development. Uh, we have to inventory parts. We have to replace 
uh, radio parts maintenance. Uh, we do also radio tower site maintenance. Um, so if we have uh, an outage, for instance, our um, 800 megahertz crew is called out to go to a radio tower to um, essentially assess that, that damage and a slew of other activities. Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> that. This equipment doesn't take care of itself. It does not. It certainly does not. And again, over you know 11,000 users, 7,000 around 7,000 right here in Cobb County. So that that is definitely a lot. Yeah. Um, so our next request, um, our operating request, um, I have a total increase here of 673,881. And I will tell you, it would I did not go through every single line item here. But what we did in uh, line items such as copy machines, office supplies. Um, gas, diesel, janitorial supplies we, uh, supplies, we gave it around a 10% increase. So for instance, not up on the slide, but a copy machines, we increased by $75. Office supplies, we increased by $511. So I'm just going to go through the highlights here. Um, so the probably the largest ask I have here is for batteries, $158,940. So we maintain several types of batteries for the radios and other equipment. So the radio batteries are to be replaced every 12 to 18 months. Um, and our current portable radio, I'm sorry. Um, so this is designed to allow for the replacement of around 1,350 batteries annually. And it's also a request to provide the replacement of our fire station alert alerting cabinet batteries, which is also a significant amount. Um, our second request for telephone landline increase of $50,350, so this is to provide for the addition of the first net one gigabyte fiber circuit, and that's to provide the radio system to the nationwide mission critical push to talk network. Um, again, another um, provides priority service over our radio network for safety reasons. $143,743 is what our general annual maintenance um, contractual agreements, which has already been approved by the Board of Commissioners. That's our general increase that we are going to um, add into the, buzz, into the budget. Uh, real estate is to uh, the $14,205 to provide for the rental of the Riverwood Building Tower site. That is our only uh, lease agreement we have, and it's a, it's a fixed, um, we have a fixed budget, but the rent does go up every year, so we need we're asking for some more funds to accommodate that rental increase. And I apologize, I, I did go out of order here. So I have some um, consumables of 48,500 and that's the projected cost of the replacement parts for the subscriber radios. Um, that's here in Cobb County only. Um, so currently we have no mechanism in place to recoup those items. So that's why we're asking for the increase. Total of $673,881 operating. Um, our next slide is the one-time capital, the tower re site camera replacement. So we're requesting to replace all the cameras for security reasons at all the tower sites at a cost of about $100,000. Um, the additional uh, request of an equipment trailer, which we currently do not have now, at about $20,000. And this is simply to help us um, allow the unit to gather and properly maintain assigned equipment. They're sometimes called out to um, a scene of a critical incident. If, if we have a large scale event, for instance, and we have multiple mutual aid agencies come in and they have to hand out radios, sometimes if it's pouring down rain, they're just out there in, in the rain doing it. Um, so we're asking for a trailer, one, for the, so they can work out of, and two, so we can house radios in and we can transport them easily, radios and, and accessories. And then the vehicle cost for the two additional positions of eighty thousand dollars, so a total of two hundred thousand. I have a question, Madam. Please, Please. Just go back. yes. Um, for the tower sites, what's the total number of cameras that you're planning to replace? Do you have that number? Just do you know the number offhand? The number, the number is about four per site, so thirty-two to thirty-five cameras. Thirty-two to thirty-five cameras. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mike. And that's all I have for 800. And again, that's out of general funds, and I will be back at the end to talk about 911. Thank you. They are rolling through this. Yes. Hey, We're just afternoon. amazed at the amount of speed that you guys have there in these presentations. So if you want to.
Yeah, okay, you're being very gracious, yes. Yeah, so. Well, to be honest with you, uh, Chief Johnson and I were quite amazed at that speed, too. I'm afraid we're about to slow it down a okay. little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Spoke too soon, exactly. <laughs> but uh, we yes, will try to move through quickly. Um, good afternoon, Chairwoman, Commissioners, and the County Manager. Uh, as all the other departments have listed, you see our um, mission statement listed on the screen. And we feel very strongly about that, uh, the service, the commitment, uh, the compassion, and uh, we just really take it to heart. We preach it from day one of the academy to all our new crew, re, re, excuse me, recruits. Now we're going to jump into some challenges and opportunities. Uh, if there's anything that Director Kreider has ever taught me is a challenge is an opportunity. So uh, we will definitely look at these as great opportunities. Okay. As you can see in here, uh, one of the first things we have is continue to address recruitment, hiring, and retention. Uh, the Board of Commissioners has been very helpful in that matter, very generous in implementation of the step and grade, and uh, then also this past year willing to take on the first leg of uh, dealing with compression. Now we realize that's something that will have to be done on a multi-year level, and we, uh, we appreciate the future uh, consideration on that. But I think that will be definitely be something that will help us. But as we move through the budget, you also see that is a significant portion of an increase in our budget that we will be looking at. Um, also, one of our other issues, we'll jump down to some of our expanded community programs, our Police Athletic League. If you did not know, we touch the lives of approximately 600 youth in our community through our Police Athletic League, and we do that on a part-time basis. One of the things you all see as we move in here, we want to make that into a full-time unit and hopefully touch even more, more lives in that area. Also, one thing that we took over this year was a partnership for assistance, treatment, and health. We call that PATH. That's a joint endeavor with the fire department and uh, the community service board mm -hmm. and trying to reach out to people who are suffering from some uh, illnesses that cause them to, to request police and fire services more often than others and try to give them other resources other than 911. Then we also need some assistance support personnel in our special victims unit. Uh, while I, oftentimes I send you uh, notifications or text messages of, of incidents that occur. I do not send you all of them, and some of them are quite heinous, uh, especially when it comes to some of our youth. Um, I choose not to burden you with some of that, but it's, it's pretty uh, graphic what some people are doing in our community to some of our youth. So we need assistance there. Many of those units are working at their max level and capacity. Uh, our Crimes Against Persons unit, and then you also heard the director talk about our Animal Services unit. While Animal Services is its own department, we have a investigator embedded in that unit, and that's been very beneficial. That's something that has not always been there. But also, like in a lot of other areas, the demand for that has increased, so we'll be asking for some assistance there and maybe another person to work in that. And then we have techno technology issues and things like that that are increasing. Continuing on our challenges and operations, uh, if you notice the first one says continue critical, critical funding of assigned vehicles for new officers and replacement vehicles. Uh, you have been generous in your uh, willingness to start a take-home car program, and just to be very honest with you, our police department could not even begin to be competitive without that program. Also, to add to that, we could not have successfully accomplished the World Series if we had not had vehicles to put out there. We had a lot of officers out there, but in the uh, probably five or six, ten years ago, all those vehicles that you saw that were used for those special events would have been tied up answering calls for service. We would have not been able to have succeeded at that. So some of this cost is being, uh, would be borne by fleet for vehicles that we already have, but we also have to anticipate any future needs of personnel will also increase our um, vehicle request. Uh, as you know, um, we're working on a real-time crime center. Quite honestly, I had hoped, I had hoped to have that up and running before I stepped away on December 31st. And while I hate to use this as an excuse, we fell victim to the supply chain issue. Uh, property management has has done the best they can and striving to help uh, speed that up. 
but even they are limited to what, what we can get our hands on on the uh, technology side. And then one of the other biggest things is our maintenance contracts. We're seeing an annual increase in maintenance contracts between 5 and 15 percent per year, and that's pretty significant. Our travel and training, uh, I'm going to touch on that in a few minutes. I think it's going to be pretty eye-opening what we're doing versus some of the other departments in the area. And then, as any good organization will do, they'll recognize the good works of their employees. And we do that through our wards and accommodations, but that budget area has really been strained at times. And at times, we brought Peter to pay Paul mm. to be able to do some of that. On this slide here, I think you'll give you a little bit of a graph of just some of the issues that we're dealing with. It shows the population increase of approximately 74,000. It may be a little bit more than that since 2010. Mm -hmm. And, but the most part, our crime, our overall crime has decreased. And that's a good thing. Now, when we look at crime, we use the uh, designation that the FBI does, part one and part two crimes. Basically, your part one crimes are your more severe uh, crimes against persons. Part two would be more towards your uh, crimes against property, your thefts and things like that. We have seen uh, pretty consistent leveling or dropping in our part two, but unfortunately we have been touched like many other uh, communities in the metro Atlanta and across the country have seen an increase in some of our homicides and our aggravated assaults. There's uh, numerous theories as to why that happened. Um, most of it ties in with uh, decisions that uh, had to be made in regards to pandemic and trying to control exposures into populations and things like that. But we, we have still dealt with that. You also, if we can go back to that slide one more time. Also, if you see in there, I believe it's in there, uh, our violent crime unit they have seen an increase in the number of illegal drugs that have, I mean, guns that have been taken off the street. Now, when I say illegal, I'm talking about guns that are in possession of people who legally cannot have them, convicted felons and individuals like that, people who are using them in commission of a crime. Mm -hmm. uh, those numbers of guns that we're taking off of those violent offenders has greatly increased. Mm -hmm. Now, part of that is because of the efficiency of the unit. It's got much better. But part of it is we're seeing more guns on the streets than we have before. That's interesting. All right, next slide, please. So we'll jump into the overall general fund budget. Uh, I had a phone call recently from an uh, individual associated with uh, one of the groups of wanting to start a city in one of the cities in Cobb County, and they wanted to just pick my brains about what it would look like to have police and fire operations. And I started with them very upfront. I said, police and fire is a very expensive endeavor. And then I gave them a very rough figure of what they could expect, and I think I shocked them mm -hmm. uh, for one city. So you'll see these numbers are rather high. And overall, we're looking at approximately 15 million increase. But before anybody gets too shocked, a lot of that is tied into anticipated approval of future step and grade, future uh, anticipation of future approval of uh, moving down the road on comp um, not compensation, uh, compression. Okay. And then we have some safety equipment needs that expire a 10-year mark, and if we do not replace those, we enter into a liability issue if an officer should get hurt. So that's going to be a bulk of what you see there. But as you can see, from 2022 to 2023, I think we're looking at a roughly a $5 million mark. I hesitate to get too specific because the chairwoman's math was pretty accurate uh, <laughs> earlier. So, uh, but you also see that increase was mainly because we took approximately 38 to 40 positions and did not fund them in a previous year, mm -hmm. and we brought those back this year. Okay, you included, y'all were gracious enough to include that funding in there. So that's where that increase is. So any additional personnel requests that I mentioned here would be above and beyond what you've already done. I think it should be noted that the step and grading com compression estimate for 2023 would be roughly 3,522,000. And for 2024, roughly 2,792,000. I think that number would continue to go down as you enter into the third year, or that would probably be about the third year, because you, a lot of that would have been uh, corrected and stabilized. 
Right. We'll jump into the actual parts of it. Under our personnel budget, I'll give you a chance to briefly look at that, and then when, in, a, in a second we'll go to the next slide and you can see what some of those uh, personnel requests might be. All right, and since we're at that slide, we're requesting eight additional police officer positions to be added to the already existing units. The eight additional officers would establish a, would help establish a, I'm sorry, additional eight, eight additional officers would establish the full-time PAL unit. I know that is something that a few of the commissioners have had a desire to have. I think it's a very worthwhile endeavor, but to do it do more than what we're doing is going to take that being a full-time unit instead of a part-time. We're also asking for additional sergeants and lieutenants positions. One of those sergeants would go to the animal control unit in that investigator slot area to oversee the investigator that is over there. It's possible that into the future there may be a need for another investigator, but we're not asking for that at this point. We're also requesting additional lieutenant at the training center. The training center was a great blessing to our police department, but it also comes with great popularity. Uh, the training center is used uh, quite a bit by all different community groups, and as a result has mandated that our staff that works all day long training recruits are uh, many times staying well into the evenings or weekends mm -hmm. over time trying to take care of the groups that are there and making sure they're able to lock up. Adding an additional lieutenant would help split some of that up and help cover some of that overtime cost. Excuse me, Chief, before you go into other yes, positions, you know, I know I've discussed with other leaders just the challenges generally in policing and with retention, and this is a comment that I've heard that I'm needing your help to help me digest is that the officers that we have now are responding to calls and therefore there may be some other things that our officers are unable to do that, you know, whether it's catching people who are speeding or responding to other lower level crimes. Can you talk about that and if those type of issues are present within our department, if those could be addressed with the 32 positions that were added or if they're addressed in this number here? Sure. Those, those situations are not necessarily addressed in this, the positions that are proposed in this request. They are, I'm sorry, they are possibly addressed with what you approved the funding for this past year, the 38 positions that we unfroze and brought back in. The situation is filling those 38 positions. And I'll go into a little bit of that and then okay. come back to the, the service. In the police world, most of the police departments had reached a point where we were all pretty close together on a starting salary, many times on fringe benefits, take-home cars, things like that. A few little issues here or there made some differences, but for the most part, we were close. But as, historic, or as history has shown us and happened this time, a local smaller jurisdiction made a drastic jump. And all of a sudden, that put the rest of us uh, behind. And as a result, everybody else is scrambling to catch up, so we're all continuing to fight for the same group of people, which that number or that pool of candidates has shrunk. Okay, so we're all fighting that same challenge, plus the uh, police organization that has taken that first step and made that increase, kudos to them on the marketing, but they do this, our community so supports our police, come work for us. And that... That gets a lot of attention from uh, senior officers that are already working. Because over time, the job, the job can take a toll on you and you feel like people do not support you. And that's not the case overall, but when you, when you deal with a portion of society that is always not the nicest mm -hmm. to you and things like that, it's easy to start feeling that way. So all other jurisdictions are trying now to catch up, ourselves included. And we're fighting for the same, same people out of the same pool and we actually have uh, recruits that will come to us and say, hey, I know this is what you say you'll provide me, but this department over here wants to do this. And they, at times they want to almost barter with you. And we don't necessarily have that flexibility. Most departments do not. Now, to answer your question about service, it really depends on the part of the county. If on the, you're on the south side of the county, yes, ma'am, you're exactly right. 
Those officers primarily are running call to call to call. So things such as traffic enforcement, that would be considered more of a um, proactive situation or even traffic complaints, those sometimes have to fall to the wayside or they get referred to our traffic enforcement unit. The problem is our traffic enforcement unit covers the whole county, so they cannot address all the complaints. Mm -hmm. And then something we'll also see in here in a second, the number of traffic fatalities has greatly increased. Our community has changed. I've spent a third of my career doing traffic accident investigations as far as fatalities. Most of those investigations dealt with fatalities in motor vehicles. We're turning more to a community that's having pedestrians die uh, because either crossing the wrong place in the roadway or speeding motors or things like that. So on the south side of the community where a lot of those type issues are occurring, the call volume has also increased, the demand for police services. So yes, there's been less time to deal with those. Your uh, northern part of what we call Precinct 4, uh, northern part of Precinct 1, and then the West Cobb area, they may have a little bit more time. Now, they also generally carry a few less officers because we're trying to put more officers in the areas with a higher call volume. Okay. So it's, it's a delicate balancing act that, that we're doing here. So what I'm hearing from you, too, is that the issue is not just having the positions available. It's having to do with officer pay and competitiveness. And yes, ma'am. Keeping people attracted to the field, which is yes, more than just having the numbers of positions yes, available. Yes, ma'am. Going back to my discussion with one of the cities that was making an inquiry about uh, a police department, I told them, I said, don't even think about starting unless you can hit the average starting pay of every other Metro Atlanta Police Department, you're willing to do a take on car program. And by the way, don't forget that police car that you're gonna pay roughly thirty to $40,000 for, there's gonna be another $50,000 worth of equipment going to each one of them. And then all that video that you need from body cameras, because you don't dare go on the road without a body camera, you gotta pay for that storage. There's a lot of cost out there that most people, they don't realize is there that's very expensive. So, Thank you. All right, if we'll jump over to the operating portion of it. All right, as I mentioned earlier, operating, one of our biggest challenges has been our maintenance contract. In 21, we had a $100,000 deficit in our budget on maintenance contract. We're asking for an increase of roughly 366000 okay? Some of our other areas that we're looking at, we've taken on with the new training center, which is great to have in the new headquarters, somebody's got to clean that facility. So our uh, cost for cleaning a larger facility has definitely hit our budget. Uh, as mentioned before, I think Cassie mentioned about an EMA, our contracts for our real-time crime center when it comes to uh, maintenance contracts, video boards and things like that those costs also will hit us, and that's where we're asking for those increases. Now to something that hits us about every 10 years, ballistic vest, gas mask, and ballistic helmets. These are a cost that uh, it's a necessity. If you don't have, uh, then your officers cannot respond uh, appropriately to major events, but they have a shelf life of 10 years and then we have to start replacing them. If we do not replace them, then we take on concerns and issues if somebody gets hurt with equipment that is beyond its expiration. So that's going to be a significant cost for us there, and that is coming up during this 23 and 24 time span. And then training. A little snapshot of our training. We have our own, own training center, and we are actually a model in that training center for other departments in Metro Atlanta and something that I envisioned has happened, we're getting departments from all over the state coming here for training, and that's, that's one thing we wanted. And we're bringing regional national training to our facility to help cut down on cost of our people traveling to other areas to attend FBI leader courses or whatever. So we've been successful there, but our general training budget, <coughs> when you look at uh, it remained roughly $120,000. You look at Gwinnett Police Department, who has a, an approved sworn staff of approximately 50 more officers than us, they're at $737,000 training budget. So and are, even you more, for, are you asking for the right number? 
Are we asking for the right number? Mm -hmm. we're, as, we're asking for what we think reason, we can be reasonable for. Okay. Now, the next thing, and this one is, is even more eye-opening, Dunwoody Police Department with approximately 60 officers, their training budget, $118,000, all right? That's barely under what, what we were trying to do with our entire Department. So I'll tell you what I shared, I think it was during our last presentation, is that we have a lot of interest to try to balance, and I know it's, appreciate, it's appreciated people want to be reasonable with us, but we also want people to be honest with us about what is really needed. Yes, so ma'am. If this is not what's really needed, please help us to understand what's really needed, because uh, even just that last number you shared, it's kind of really apples to oranges comparison when you look at the size of the yes, departments. And you know, it's just helpful to know because we want people to be trained and we want to keep the best employees and the best officers here. But you know, we want the investment. The investment has to reflect that. So I'm just hoping that. Yes, ma'am. And, and I think if us. we get this increase, during this 23, 24, and then increased it further for 25, 26. That would put us where we really, the sweet spot we need to be. Much like we looked at as far as compression and step and grade, doing a multiple, multiple step program okay. instead of all at once is sort of what we were striving for. And then I think it also should be noted that we've all offset some of these costs where we've been deficit with our fuel budget. The cost of fuel has been down for the last couple of years. Unfortunately, it seems like it's going up, but we've been able to see some cost savings there that we've been able to use to uh, cover some of our deficit areas. Now, we, um, we'll move on to our capital. And I'm gonna look at this as in two different uh, sections, 23 and 24 separately. So we'll start with the 23 slide. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Y'all have been very generous and with this, uh, our take home car program and uh, much of the replacement vehicle cost is coming through fleet. But with the additional personnel that we would ask for, we would have to buy vehicles that would not be replacement vehicles. These would be vehicles for the new positions. Okay. Also, I made mention a few minutes ago about the police car, the equipment that goes in it and the cost of approximately another forty to $50,000. We have tried two different ways of doing this, of putting those vehicles together ourselves, ordering that equipment, and we've tried turnkey through an organization. We've seen more success when we handle the equipment purchase ourselves and then have the installer put it in. Our shortfall on this is having the facility to do it. And at times we're running police vehicles all over the northern part of the state of Georgia to different install facilities, anywhere from Macon to Gainesville and up to Ackworth because the sheer volume of uh, police vehicles that are needing to be put together that there's only a limited number of installers and they're trying to do the state patrol and all other police departments in the state. So one of these costs would be to take a facility that's out at fleet and an estimated cost of $150,000 and make that into a s equipment storage and a installation facility, okay? That would give us a place to work out of. <clears throat> That's something we've not done before, but I, I see great value and benefit in it. And then also our, our canine kennels. While our canines go home with, their, with the officers, when those officers go and take uh, leave, may go out of town with their family, somebody still has to take care of that canine. So what we would like to do is take some uh, money, an estimated $75,000, build a facility at Animal Services where that canine would be would not be introduced into the regular animal population, but would have its own police canine, mm -hmm. um, basically a, a hotel type stay facility for them. During that vacation time, they would be fed and, and taken care of by animal services. And we already have vet services that are there. Okay, so that would be a, a cost and we, we would see a, a great benefit there. there. And I, I knew I volunteer to keep them. You volunteer to keep them? <laughs> Well, I just need to be very upfront with you. We're looking at uh, probably requesting two new canines, having to replace two new canines every year for the next two years. So you're talking about four new dogs. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. okay. They're not going to all go on vacation at the same time, hopefully. Uh, hopefully they do not. I'll take one, two at a time. Okay. Um, one of the other things is I mentioned briefly was body camera, in-car cameras and body cameras. In today's society, you do not dare run a police department without that, even though there are police departments in the state of Georgia that do not have camera systems, and it totally amazes me why and how they even do it. But it's a very costly endeavor. We are entering into our third year with our current camera vendor. We have had challenges with this vendor, but we feel like they have turned the corner and are making it right and made some financial incentives to make up for some of the shortfalls. So next year, we will go into, uh, I have to make a decision, do we ask for an extension, one year extension of the contract, or do we look for an additional vendor? Either way, there's a cost to it. And video, the equipment and storage is expensive. So that's going to be a significant uh, cost. Also, our records management system, it's nearing the end of its useful life lifespan, and we will be needing to uh, make a change there. We've reached the point where every time we see event, uh, the um, potential of something, being able to pull data out of it that they do not already provide for us, and we suggest to them, hey, getting us this data by building this module will be greatly beneficial to us, they're willing to do it, but it's always at a cost, and that cost is significant. So we're at the point we either need to go with a uh, new records management system or we're going to pay significant costs to continue with what we already have and get the benefits that we need out of it. Yes, Commissioner. Um, going back to the kennels. Yes, ma'am. Could that not be part of the new building for that shelter that's part of the SPLOS? Adding the, are, are the kennels included in that SPLOS project? If it's at the, at the facility? I'm not familiar with, if it is not, I can get Shannon with it, I guess. It's just a building on the SPLOS list? Oh, no, 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 it will include the build out of the inside, yes, absolutely. Okay. So I, I, if I'm following you, I, yes, maybe some of that cost could be I would, fall under yeah, the SPLOS for the new the animal services. Because it'll that would be definitely be located where the new building will be. Right. Central. Yeah. Right. Pros and cons. That's, that's definitely a, a good idea and something that we can look at and be a cost savings for us. And as I mentioned a minute ago, um, our canines, we, we get approximately 10 years of service out of a canine before they develop um, physical uh, problems that prevent them to continue service. And we're on track for retiring and needing to replace two canines each year for 23 and for 24. Okay. The canines come trained? Mm -hmm. Well, they actually do come uh, probably about 70% trained. Okay. And we send the uh, canine officer that's going to be assigned to them, we send them down to the vendor. Mm -hmm. And the canine officer stays there on site for roughly a three week period where the rest of that training is done between the the vendor's trainer and our canine officer. And it's also a bonding time. So when that dog comes back to us, yes, it's trained, but then we also have an in-house training uh, program that we do that's been recognized by other departments and other Metro departments join in with us as we continue weekly training on those okay. dogs. Good deal. So. 29,000 is, that's a nice dog, nice couple <laughs> dogs. All right. Um, considerably. <laughs> And then one of the other things that's going to hit us, if you'll see the specially equipped vehicles, that's going to be vehicles such as our bomb, bomb unit, uh, the larger vehicles, our dive team, uh, and things like that. Our bomb team, the large vehicles, they are needed to carry the large bomb robots, which is obviously a life-saving piece of equipment for our technicians. Our dive team, they've been using the same vehicle for a long time, and I'll give you a, a little example of what is needed. Uh, I sent a text to uh, the district commissioner and the uh, county manager and the director this morning, but we have, we've had a, K, a KSU student that's been missing for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. We went missing from a location inside the city of Kennesaw. But through investigation and a joint effort between us and uh, Kennesaw PD, we located his vehicle in a nearby lake, or near, I'm sorry, parked near a nearby lake. 
we did all of our investigation and finally made a decision that there's a high probability he is in the lake. Mm -hmm. So our bomb team, I'm sorry, our dive team at eight o'clock this morning was wow. getting into that water. And you know how cold it was at eight o'clock yes. this morning. Yeah. So when you spend time under that water surface in this kind of temperature and you come back out, you need a vehicle that you can get into and warm up. Unfortunately, they located the individual in the lake today. So our, our, our men and women on the dive team did their job. It was a sad ending. But it's, there's a need for that piece of equipment. They've, they spent mm -hmm. those uh, 30 and 40 degree temperatures underwater. Interesting. So that's what we're looking at for some improvements in those vehicles. All right, and then the next slide will just be a recap of the first one out there of the overall budget. I'm gonna give you a moment to look at that again. And then just when you thought I, you were done with me, I get, to, I get to present another budget to you. All right, our police training center. The training center, the operations uh, does not fall under the budget, same budget as the police department. The personnel aspects of it do. So as we go through here, you will see there's not a change so much in the personnel side of it because that's being absorbed in the, in the PD budget. But when it gets down to your operating in your capital, that's where the changes will be. Roughly, it's a requested increase of 280,000 uh, from 22 to 23, and then 101,000 into 24. On the operating budget side of it, the operating budget has been pretty much the same for many years. Uh, we're requesting a total increase of roughly 54,000 in that. While that's 54000 to me is a lot of money, that's one of the smaller requests when you consider the PD side of the budget and that we've made requests. Most of that will be our annual maintenance contracts. And then while we did get a new facility and we received uh, a significant amount of new furniture, we have some other furniture that was transferred over that was very used and is ending its service life and we need, we're going to need to replace that. And I've already mentioned the janitorial services. And then the training center has evolved into a little bit of an event center. And while outside organizations use it, and we do not necessarily provide their refreshments. We, we have used it significantly within the county government and within the police department. So we, we are asking for a slight increase in our awards, food, and accommodation, of, yes, accommodations in that area. Now for our capital side of it, for 23, we're requesting 226,000 in capital expenses, and then um, reduced back down to uh, 101 and 24. Big part of that expense is going to be a building at our EVOC track. Uh, if you've ever, I'm assuming you know where the EVOC track is, but if you don't, it's right next to the safety village. And if you ever drive by there, you'll see the orange, usually see the orange cones and you'll see a building that is out there. That building is, while it's not the oldest building, it's become termite infested. And it has some structural issues as a result of that, the termite infestation and the viewing area, the stands where the classes sit while they watch their fellow students, recruits, perform out on the EVOC track. Those areas need to be replaced they're fastly becoming unusable. So that's where the bulk of that cost would be on that observation deck and then to help replace that building. And then that's mainly for 2023. For 2024, this is an anticipation that uh, everything goes well on uh, a land purchase and the uh, firing range going to an indoor range, which we, will be a great improvement for us but there is a cost to that as any commercial indoor range, and that is removing the lead from use within that range to cut down on exposure. So we would see roughly $125,000 cost per year on that, um, of taking that lead out. And then we'll wrap it up with an overall look at the training budget, the requested uh, for the training budget. And any questions? None here. Commissioners, any questions? Yeah. Commissioner Brown. Mm -hmm. is, is that the um, 
old training center on Valor, the academy? No, ma'am. This is the new one on East West Connector. The new one already? The one off Offshore <laughs> Road. Yeah, the East West Connector. Our training facility on East West Connector, mm -hmm. the design all along was to have an indoor firing range there. There right. was not enough SPLOS money on the initial SPLOS. No, I'm talking about the renovations <laughs> for the building. Oh, the, I'm sorry, the EVOC track. Yeah, that's, the, that's okay. the, at Valor Drive, right? It's not on Valor. It's next to the it's safety, safety building. Village. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And right. right now at our new training facility on East West Connector, we do not have a facility that will hold the EVOC track. Mm -hmm. Maybe one day we will, but we will maintain that EVOC track where it's at for right now. Okay. Thank right. you for your time, Chief. All right, thank you. I know Bill is like, don't mess with my. Um, well, I was going to tell him that we would be happy to take that 125 and clean the lead up over at Ballard Drive any day. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Chairwoman, Commissioners, mm -hmm. County Manager. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to come and, and speak to you today to, uh, to really present the needs of the organization. When we started this as a, as a command staff, I think we really were, hey, what are our wants? But when we really boiled it down, we really got to a final copy or final product. This is really our needs. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go over a couple of things that we're very proud of in the organization, but just because of these accomplishments, we still have things and through some of these, uh, like our accreditation team, and I'll, repeat, I'll go over that again, they, they provide us with areas where we need to improve. And so a lot of this is from that. So as many of you are aware, you know, last month, the uh, CPSE sent us accrediting agency for the fire service. They were here and we're happy. To, we've been an accredited agency for 20 years. And so we're happy to report that when they were here, when they left, they're recommending us for accreditation again. So in March, myself and the command staff and the director will go and sit before a commission and hopefully become an accredited agency for five more years. We're also an IS01 uh, agency and y'all are well aware of that, but I just want to give you some numbers. Of over 29,500 fire departments in the United States, less than 120 of those fire departments are accredited and an ISO 1 rating class fire department. And that's your fire department. So we're very proud of that. So up here first, we have our uh, mission statement. I'm not going to read it. Y'all can go through that. When we sit down with you individually, we can go through it in detail. So you can go to the next slide. Oh, there you go. We're going to spend some time here. Uh, our challenges in the organization. Uh, average inadequate staffing daily, we average somewhere around 30 people out per day for various reasons. This does not include annual leave or sick leave. It could be parental leave, military leaves, uh, leave of absence from injury, workers' comp type things. But that's 30 people per day. Uh, can you give us the rough number of how many, out of how many you're talking about? Well, Overall, mm -hmm. we have 794 approved positions. They're not all full. We have 50-something openings. But per day, if you go, if you talk about the number of staff in the field, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, we're 160-ish in the field. In the field every day, we're around 160 people. And then, of course, we have our 40-hour staff, whether it's training, fire marshal's office, education, other areas. So, but 30 people is pretty significant. Uh, aging apparatus and facilities. And I can tell you, just up last week, we had 27 that were out. So uh, aging apparatus and facilities, uh, we've been very gracious in that we've gotten some new fire stations through SPLOST and we've been able to build some through some uh, fire fund balance, but we do have some facilities that need to be replaced. Over the next years, we have nine fire stations earmarked that are gonna need to be replaced over the coming years. Uh, aging apparatus, we have a, an annual replacement on our engines and we try to do that on our, on our aerials, but as of today, I was, we just, Thankfully, we had an agenda item passed today. Those apparatus that were approved today will be a minimum. If we order them tomorrow, it'll be a minimum of 17 months before we see them in the county. Oh, wow. And so by the time we have to be really forward thinking, our annual budget is not always including or always fully funding our capital needs. And then the last bullet here, from the time someone leaves, until we get a fully trained firefighter that is riding on the seat of a fire truck is very long. You know, our recruit schools are a minimum of a year. We're having two recruit schools a year, so we're looking, it could be at 
at least 18 months from, some, from the time someone leaves until we have someone riding in the seat of a fire truck. You know, just to, uh, and then some of the stuff that the director mentioned earlier, as we add new programs, you know, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul, like he said. When we add programs, we have to take people from the field to fill these positions, and we'll go into some of those later. And also, you know, we, we try to update our strategic plan and keep it going. And based on this and what, what we get from this, we'll be updating our strategic plan so that we can follow it more, more closely. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's our fire fund budget slide that we want to go over. And I won't spend very much time on it because we'll go through detail moving forward through all of this. You know, for uh, 22, we have an adopted budget of uh, right at 109 million. For 23, we're proposing 121, and 24, proposing 114. And you can see for uh, 23, we're asking for an 11% change, and it'll go down to somewhere around the right at a uh, five, right at 6% less for uh, 24. So next slide, please. This slide, similar to what Chief Cox presented to you earlier, talks about you know the population increase, our run increases, and as well as our staff. You may notice that the blue line is our, our, our run numbers, 19 from down to 20, there was a, a decrease. Well, that was because of COVID. We changed our, our run cards and how we responded on calls, so that, that makes sense. And I can tell you, based on the run numbers today and the projections based on our average calls per day, we will run over 63,000 calls this year. So it'll be back up to uh, where we were pre-pandemic. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's where we're gonna get into what we're requesting for the personnel over the next two years. You can see in 23, we're asking for the 23, 24 total, we're asking for a total of 48 positions. And I'll go through those to tell you what those are. But it is, it's a 6% you know, increase in cost over that time frame. All right, so the first one, we broke ours down into three different sections. In the fire department, we have community risk reductions, preparedness, and response. So I'll go through each section or each one of those divisions for the next three pages. And our first one is we want to up, upgrade five fire protection engineers to fire inspector twos. Our fire inspector, uh, inspection engineers are very specialized uh, positions, but the problem is we cannot compete with the public sector. Chief Crumley advertised for a fire protection engineer position multiple times. We had some internal candidates that, would, that he offered the job to, but they didn't take it because the pay wasn't going to be as much as they would make as a fire inspector too. So we're behind the curve. So he's really thought of some creative ways. And so what we want to do is take those fire protection engineers, change those to fire inspector twos, and that would create a career path within the fire marshal's office. So whether we have someone who hires on from the outside of the organization into the fire marshal's office or someone that we bring in early on in their career, that would give them an opportunity to move up within that organization. Again, our fire protection engineers, they are fire inspectors sometimes anyway, and so this would fit right into the plan that he has for, for that division. The next one is a, another fire inspector too, but this is one that we've talked to you about specifically, Chairwoman, and the county manager. You know, for y'all hear it, and, and each one of you send us emails or call, we hear all the time where there's sometimes there's this disconnect, it seems like, between community development, the building department, our fire marshal's office, and why can't I get this done? I've got this permit there, you know, and it's, it's you know, sometimes the, the, the citizens don't feel like the left hand's talking to the right hand. Mm. So talking to, you know, Jessica Gwynn, you know, we've, she came up with this idea that we would like to embed some people from the fire marshal's office into her building so that when people come in for these inspections and these reports and, you know, they're trying to get a seal or whatever that is, there's someone from our office there that they can marry up with and talk to and they can get a very clean, crisp idea of what the next process is. And so that, that fire inspector would be one of those. And Chief Crumley has a plan that he'll rotate those inspectors through so that they get all have an opportunity to see and get the training in that. Okay. The next one again is, or the next three positions are for our, our fire inspector, FMO, and they're fire inspector ones. 
Right now we have our fire inspectors uh, broken up into geographical location. The northern part of the county, or what we call our northern district, they have more inspectors than the southern district, so we need another inspector down there. We also, in that way, we can keep get called up. The other two positions, uh, because of things that have happened over the last couple of years with some facilities and, and things that have come to light, we realize now that we really, we really need some inspectors that are dedicated solely to storage facilities, storage and warehouse facilities. That's the thing that we've kind of fallen behind on, but just because of staffing. We've needed these positions for quite some time. And again, because of certain, I guess, businesses have brought this to light within the county, uh, we, we need to really focus on making sure. We ultimately feel like we're gonna need quite a few more, but these two will get a handle on where we are and how frequent we need to be visiting these facilities. And we'll get an idea based on that, the number of inspectors we're gonna need. This next one, if you look across it and, when you, and you look at the cost and you see zero, it might get you excited. But this is one that we've teamed up with IS. We've talked to Kimberly Limley. I don't know if you remember from her presentation, she talked about how busy they are and the number of work orders that come through the help desk. Uh, our IS position in fire closes out more work orders individually than anybody else in the county. The only place that has more work orders annually is the help desk itself. He is, he's responsible for 29 fire stations, all our iPads, all our MDCs, you know, all of these things, and then all you know, headquarters, our fire annex, our training. And so he's just completely overwhelmed. So when we went to Kimberly and said, hey, we would like to talk about this, she said, I already got that position there. But we wanted to bring it to light that we need it. It's gonna be covered through the IS budget, but that's a position that we really need at fire headquarters. The admin specialist too is pretty self-explanatory. That's for uh, Nick Dahl, our fire marshal. And then the public service tech three, this person would be assigned with that fire inspector two at community development as an admin to help. We use fire, uh, this public service techs in our, in our fire marshal's office uh, for that. So let's go back one slide. Oh, that, we you added that today. He didn't have to say it for us to say Thank that. you. It was not missed, Director oh, Carter, I promise you. You saw those. Y'all didn't think he slid one by you. I was trying to, you know. Uh, <laughs> we wanted to go ahead and bring, obviously, we're very appreciative that the board has stepped up and said, hey, we're going to commit to stepping grade, but it's very costly. Mm -hmm. And we understand that. So there it is. Uh, for FY23 is the line under the cost column. The step is 1.8 million and the compression piece is two point, right at 2.4. And we just went ahead and added the 24 there so we could see those in comparison. Uh, 1.8 and 24 for the step, and then 723,000 for the compression piece. So that's just $4 million to do what we said we were gonna do. Yes, ma'am. Step in grade. And I, but I will tell you, uh, fortunately, we haven't lost a lot of firefighters to other organizations, we do lose them to just go do other things. Uh, but I, I truly believe once we get this step in grade in place, we're gonna see a large decrease in the number. I've, I've had conversations with chiefs from the Metro Atlanta area. They're all experiencing firefighters leaving the industry. Uh, but we do believe here in Cobb that once this step in grade gets in place, we're gonna, we're gonna be uh, well ahead of the curve on that one. So we appreciate it. Thanks. Next slide. All right, this is for uh, our response division. Uh, the first one is a big number for us, but it's we currently have two positions in our, our headquarters that we call district chiefs. We want to add one more chief to that, and we're going to make those shift commanders. Those district chiefs will come off a 40-hour work week. They'll go to a 24-48, and it'll be more of a span of control issue, if you will. The fire department in the next several years, but as the way we're growing, we've got a couple of stations that we're looking to add. We're gonna have the need to go to a sixth battalion currently. We, similar to like what we did with the groundbreaking with the sixth precinct this week, uh, we'll do a sixth battalion in the fire department. Those positions are gonna be essential in the span of control and oversight of those battalion chiefs on, while they're on duty. The next one, we have several positions through uh, on this page for these, and uh, it's, it's the CARES and PATH. 
y'all, we work with the police and community services board on the PATH side, and that's more of the mental health response. The CARES unit is something we've been doing for quite some time. And in one word, I asked our EMS chief, as a matter of fact, I asked him today, I said, how would you describe the increase in CARES response since the pandemic? And his one word was exponential. Exponential. And these are high 911 utilizers, you know, and then CARES and PATH, they're used synonymously. And once our people get out there, they realize, hey, maybe this is a CARES issue where a person just needs some assistance on maybe the proper adult protective services or whatever the, the, the right avenue to get them the help they need. Or it could be the mental health side. And so, well, we're, we're ready to move forward with those. This is one of those Robin Peter to pay Paul instances because we've already taken people from the field to set up these units. And, and I can tell you just on the CARES, they've, re they've reduced the number of high 911 utilizers by 75%. When, that, when they go visit that person, they have a 75% success rate that they won't call back 911. Or they they do follow ups, and so we we foresee that this becoming basically a division of its own. They're, we're going to have multiple units, and so we're trying to get ahead of that and get prepared. So we need a captain for that. We also need a, a lieutenant for that, and we also need an engineer. And those will the captain will oversee the program. The lieutenant and engineer they'll be actually out running the calls with the cares and path with the. The, the social worker, the clinician, if you will, and working with PD, uh, and then as well as two firefighters. Uh, the big one on this one, uh, the chairwoman and I have had lengthy conversations about the amount of overtime we use in the fire department. We're, and it'll take a long time for us to get these, but we, we realize, based on the numbers I showed you earlier with our staff, and we're requesting 24 additional firefighter positions so that in time, and it'll take time before we get there, but once we can, with two recruit schools a year, over the next couple of years, we hope that we'll get to a point where our staffing will be at a level when we do have these increased numbers of people who are out on different types of leave, whatever those are. We're not gonna have to backfill those positions with overtime positions. Because we're not gonna, we, we have done that to an effort that we have never shut down, a, a browned out a fire station, if you will. We're not going to make that decision. We feel like every citizen in the county deserves to have that fire station in service as much as any others. It doesn't matter where they are. And so we're asking for 24 additional firefighters there. And then the last one, uh, our data division. In the words of the team lead who came to Cobb for our accreditation process last month, he said, here's how I'm going to present Cobb County to the commission. Cobb County is a forward-facing data-driven dri uh, fire department forward-facing, data-driven. And so our data division works tirelessly to provide us the reports and doing the accreditation and the things that we need to be successful. And so we need, and this has been in our strategic plan for years, but we just haven't had the opportunity to fill this position. So we're asking for another fire data tech, a uh, fire data tech. Next slide, please. On our preparedness division, most of y'all, I think, have seen our fire annex building. We had some agenda items uh, with some work that's going on with it. We have multiple things there. We have our PAT facility there. We have our vehicle maintenance. We have our support services. We've got 10-8 in there. We just, y'all approved an agenda item today where we're gonna have a gear cleaning facility. We have a small engine group that works out of there. We have a large amount of people there. In our strategic plan years ago, we had a chief officer that was there. And at the time, we just didn't need that position at the annex. So we're bringing it back forward to say, hey, we're at a point where we need to fill that just for some high level oversight of that facility. The next positions, we have uh, three training positions three training lieutenants. Uh, one, two of those training lieutenants will be for our training division, teaching fire recruits and our firefighters that are currently employed. You know, we're, we're asking for all these positions. We're, we're telling you that we're short staffed. We've increased our recruit schools from one to two a year in an effort to try to get more people into the fire stations. 
quicker because we were just doing one a year. And the other one is another one that most of y'all are familiar with. It's our pathway program. And I'm happy to briefly explain it, but when we get to the one-on-ones, we can give you the nuts and bolts or get into the weeds, if you will. But that's basically a program where we're going to have high school students go through our fi uh, certified firefighter uh, track, if you will. They'll, they'll become a firefighter, take the test when they come 18. We'll also put them through EMT school, and that'll give them a pathway into applying to Cobb County once they graduate. There's other departments who are doing this with huge success, and so we want to do that here in Cobb County as well. So one of the lieutenants and three of the drivers on the line below, those are specifically positions for that pathway program, and that's another one where we've robbed Peter to pay Paul. We already have some of those positions in place because the school district is ready for us to move forward. And so, and then the other, on the engineers, on those six that you see, uh, we again, we need recruit school trainers, and we need one in our support services division. And just to kind of give you, it's not on this slide, but just to kind of, like Chief Cox had said on some other his stuff, our training division, we tell our people, we would put our training division up against anybody in the state or the southeast. We feel like we do a phenomenal job. But a similarly sized fire department in the metro Atlanta area, they have 35 firefighters or, or staff, if you will, assigned to their training division. We do the same thing with 17. So we, we realize we're, we really need more help to, because we're adding more programs and, and doing more and we've added recruit schools. So that's the reason we're asking for those. And then that last one, we just threw it in here because it, it was the smallest of the slides, but our overtime budget every year, we blow it way out of the water. So we've asked to increase it by $675,000 in 23 and 24 to bring it up to 1.5. And even still, I'll just, just, you know, if we're being real, we went above 1.5 this year, but we're hoping to be able, as we hire more people, to be able to bring that down. So that's the reason that that was there. Next slide, please. We're going to operating now. And you can see from the slide, 23, we're asking for a 1 million uh, increase, a 8% increase, and that'll go, obviously that'll carry on as we move forward. And we'll go into the details on the next slide. And I'm not gonna hit every single one because it just, this, I don't think it's necessary, but some of the bigger items were, you know, personal protective gear. The personal protective gear for the fire service, like you saw with some of that specialized gear for the PD, it's very expensive. And we provide our people with two gear, two sets of personal protective gear. And uh, that, Every, ten, every five years, our people get a new set of firefighting gear to, to meet the NFPA standard. Accountable items, you know, $215,000. As we add positions, we need to have more mobile radios and whatnot. And then just some of the other things, uh, you know, paramedic license. We have a program where we, rather than being affiliated with a specific school for paramedics, people can go on their own and we'll reimburse them up to a certain point. And so, and then, you know, there's some vehicle outside repair and maintenance, but the others are pretty self-explanatory. Next slide, please. And the last couple of slides we'll go over, or last few, is uh, we'll talk about our capital. And I'll go into specifics on each one of these or kind of give you an idea of what we're asking. So when we say we would like to fully fund our capital as best we can, you know, every year we have for our vehicles, this is not emergency response vehicles. This is just staff vehicles. We have a huge pool of staff vehicles and we replace uh, about five every year we've kind of gotten behind on that because we really need to replace more we have several that we've taken to fleet and they go <laughs> we don't even work on those anymore and so now we have to surplus those so that 480,000 that's five uh, replacement vehicles plus vehicles for the new positions that will require uh, a vehicle our facilities uh, you'll see that this is a uh, 4.6 million I'll go ahead and just let you know, four million of that is for a replacement fire station. And that's the actual replacement cost, and you'll see the other in, this, in the 24 budget slide. We'll never be able to build a fire station from RFP, selection process, to us occupying it within a year. It's at least 18 months or longer process, probably closer to two plus years. And so we figured it'd be more economical and, and more streamlined to split that up uh, evenly throughout the, over the two-year process. So that's that. And then some others you can see uh, uh, as far as the fire headquarters renovations. Apparatus, $3 million. Again, we budget or we request 
to replace three engines per year. And so three engines somewhere in the pushing right around $2.4 million for three engines. And then included in that, we have an air truck. Also included in the apparatus part of that is a transport capable rescue. And that's 250,000. That is something, and, and I need to go back and correct myself on something. That is something that we believe is gonna be covered through ARP, ARPA. We've talked to, the, the director had some conversations with the, uh, the company and it, it looks like those will be covered through ARPA. Uh, and some of those cares and paths on the previous slides, I, I failed to mention that. We feel like they'll be covered through ARPA as well. We'll just have to pick those salaries up on the, once that ends in 24. So and then the there. equipment on the equipment side, a million dollars, 750,000 of that is cardiac monitors. Again, that is ALS equipment, advanced life support equipment that we carry on our advanced life support units. But that's another thing that we feel like is going to be covered through the ARPA. So that number could decrease if that's something that is covered for this. Are you talking about the county's allocation or is there another program? Through the, through the counties? Through the counties. And those are through initial conversations that the director had, and he's reported those to me. Okay. Obviously, that hasn't been, we don't have confirmation that that is covered, but it's something that is eligible. I guess okay. that's a eligible. better way to say okay. it. It's eligible to be covered. And then there was a question asked about SPLOS. Does, has SPLOS been considered with any of the capital requests? Or are these above and beyond? Well, we haven't. This, these are above and beyond. in our capital okay. uh, for 22, or excuse me, in SPLOS for 22, we have Station 12 and District 3. We do have some SPLOS money that's going to go towards our training center. We had $3 million that was given to us from the 16 SPLOS, and then an additional 14, Kevin? 17 million uh, in, the, in the 22 SPLOS for our training. So that does help with some of the capital. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Well, and you still have Fire Station 29 from the 2005 SPLOS. We so do. where are we with that? We are finishing up the letter of intent, correct, Adam? And so once we finish up that letter of intent, hey, we think it's gonna happen, <laughs> but we don't wanna get our, get our hopes up. It's still the unicorn, right? And, uh, and so we just, we're, we're hoping. We, you okay, know, so where is the new fire station two? Not, station two is, is on Barber Road. It's really close to Fair Oaks Elementary at the intersection of South Cobb Drive oh, and Austell right. Road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very old fire station. As a matter of fact. But is this for a rebuild of it or? Yes, ma'am. It's a rebuild. It's not a new fire station. It's a replacement. But of, will it be torn down and replaced totally? We have some, pro we have a, the piece of property we have, we feel like we can build it on site while we still stay in the fire station. The, the property there is big enough, we believe. And so we won't have to move them out. We'll just rebuild next to it. Our friends at Parks donated a facility for us. It's the old Fair Oaks Community Center. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, so you're going to renovate that inside? No, ma'am. We're going to tear it down uh. and build a new fire station. That, that should have been on the 22 spots. Um, I mean, we, we don't have the money in the fire fund. and We know what the emphasis was on whatever. the 2022 spots. So, but we're asking, and, and as we can, as our fire fund, and we work with Bill Volkman and his team, as you know, I mentioned, we have nine fire stations. It would take, for, it'd take years and years and years to get to a point where we could cover them through the capital, as the, fire, as the fund balance gets there, we'll request those funds to replace stations as well when we have enough money there. Okay. Next slide, please. And then the 24 is very, it's almost a mirror image of what you saw for 23. Uh, vehicles, the same thing we just talked about. Uh, facilities, uh, 450,000. Uh, there we should have, there should, that's a misprint. When we changed it this morning, I should have had them put the four million from to make the second half of station two apparatus. There's that's more on this one because it's three engines plus an aerial. Because you know, again, we're we're, we're at a point where we need to replace. We're at, we really really need to replace at least three of our aerials, so that'll be in 24. And the equipment is the exact same thing. Seven hundred fifty thousand of that is cardiac monitors because we need a total of 30. 
And then we have some hazmat monitors, some technical rescue equipment, some vehicle maintenance equipment. That's part of their large capital purchases that f uh, funnel into that. So with that, I'm done. Thank Unless you, you have questions. Commissioners, do you have any additional questions? Thank you, appreciate it. Thank y'all very much. Hello again. Hello. Okay, they saved the best for last? Is that <laughs> how it goes? I know it's been a very long day, so I really want to say thank you uh, again. I will try and get through this as quickly as possible, but thank you for the opportunity to present to you again today. Um, I, I make jokes about saving the best for last, but I will say that the Department of Emergency Communications, our ENAL One Center, without it, the rest of the departments in public safety could not run. Uh, the questions that we ask, the, the decisions that we make truly sets the pace for the entire incident. The, for, the call comes into 911, and then we disseminate it to one of the public safety agencies. So truly the first of the first responders, and you probably will, will hear me say that a lot throughout this presentation. Um, our mission statement, obviously, I, I'm not going to, um, same as uh, Chief Johnson, I'm not going to uh, read it. It's there for you. I wanted to uh, make sure that everybody does understand, though, that the E-901 fund has absolutely no impact on residential taxes. It's its own fund. It's funded solely on 911 revenue, uh, which is from landline and wireless surcharges. So we are self-sustaining uh, budget. And I do want to uh, also state that it is very rare for a 911 center to operate and be funded solely on 911 revenue. As a 31-year uh, 911 subject matter expert veteran, I can tell you that for 100% certainty. Um, the FCC has a report out there in 2018 that says about 73% of 911 centers across the country um, have to dip into the general fund. They cannot sustain their um, budget. Cobb mm -hmm. County is a, a rare instance. I'm very proud of the fact that we are still a self-sustaining budget. So with that being said, some of our challenges, um, as I'm, I'm sure you've heard throughout these presentations, is uh, compensation constraints do prevent us from attracting and retaining highly skilled staff for critical positions. We're, we're also challenged to establish appropriate staffing levels to safely and effic efficiently process through emergency and non-emergency calls. Um, I will tell you that what sets us apart from other 911 centers in this state and in this country is that we provide a level of service that's far beyond what you will hear in what has been experienced before in this state. And so I do want to state publicly that 911 service is not the same um, across the state and across the country. But the services that you receive in Cobb County are far superior than other services uh, in an, even around us in the metro Atlanta area. Um, for instance, we do provide instructions like CPR instructions over the phone, emergency medical dispatch instructions over the phone prior to ambulance response. Uh, we call that the zero minute response. So basically we are initiating patient care prior to ambulance arrival. That same service is not available in every jurisdiction, if you will, but we do provide that service here in Cobb County. We are currently um, down 24 positions, but as um, I had stated in a previous agenda item that we are also understaffed by an additional 44, 44 positions, which I will get to when we get to our positions request. Uh, but I do want to also take this opportunity to thank the county manager, to thank you, um, Chairwoman, and the commissioners for approving, again, our um, hiring incentive and our stay incentive. It has been highly successful. Um, our hiring event from, the, from November 20th and our incentive, I, I did just receive a report from a hiring um, and background supervisor that says that I have 16 uh, applicants ready to be scheduled for their behavioral interviews right now, so that is awesome. Yeah. Um, so thank you again. We're challenged to improve all areas of uh, operations and performance by relaunching and continuing to maintain a full quality assurance and training program. We, um, I was witnessing some challenges when I first arrived here with regards to our quality assurance program, so we, we give it a bit of a facelift and we're relaunching that program so we can um, ensure that we provide the best service to the citizens of Cobb County. I will tell you this, that without a training, a full training and quality assurance program, I, I equate that to uh, just as much priority as the operations of the 911 center. Without a training and quality assurance program, we cannot operate. We have to have both. 
Um, we are challenged and hope to improve our call process and compliance in order to be accredited by the major dispatch organizations through the International Academies of Emergency Dispatch. Um, but I also do want to take the opportunity to say what our accomplishments are. We have been uh, re-accredited by the Commission of Accreditation and Law Enforcement Agencies, CALEA, for the seventh time this past July. Uh, we are also an um, APCO training certification agency. APCO stands for the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials, which does tell you that we have a very robust training program. Next slide. So I wanted to throw this slide up there just to give you an idea of perspective of where we are at with call volume in 2020. As a matter of fact, I can give you the stats. As of 8 o'clock yesterday morning, December 13th, we were at 802,131 calls for service, total calls for service, total calls that we received in the Nile One Center thus far, thus this year. So I think we're going to be on target to hit around 900,000 calls for 2021 and our target, you know, we've, the way we've been increasing every year about anywhere between 40 to 60,000 every year with the exception of 2020, we don't like to speak about that. Um, I imagine we'll be up to about 910 to 940 or 50,000 by next year. Okay, so here is our total request. Again, I will preface this by stating that now one is solely funded on now one revenue. So we're not asking the general fund for any money. So I have a total position request increase of 3,734,082, a total operating request of 31,420, and I promise I will explain those numbers. Uh, what we are hopeful for is that the Georgia Emergency Communications Authority has uh, reintroduced a bill into the House um, that increases the 911 surcharge fees from $1.50 to $2 an hour, which hopefully if it passes, it will obviously increase our revenue. Um, that was something that was introduced last year and it did not make it through, so we're pretty hopeful that it's gotten some traction this year. Okay, next slide. So let's start with personnel. So I am requesting 38 additional emergency communications officer positions. I realize that does sound like a lot, um, but I, I will tell you that in 2016, 2017, Mission Critical Partners, our consultant came in and did a complete strategic plan and staffing study. Um, many things were implemented from that strategic plan from a technology standpoint, but many things from the staffing study was not implemented. Um, so with that and plus my assessment, since I have arrived here six months ago, I, I have determined that with the increase in workload, the increase in technology, the expanding service, has us at what we need to sustain ourselves is 38 additional emergency communications officer positions. The next um, position we actually are requesting is a budget analyst. Because 911 fund is so unique um, and it's its own revenue source, we are requesting this additional position to be added to our admin staff. Um, to increase the span of control along with the 38 uh, emergency communications officer positions, I'm requesting four additional operations supervisor positions and two additional operations manager positions, again, for the span of control and the workload increase. Um, we, I have worked with um, Kim Lemley, the IS director, with regards to um, our information services application support analyst position that we're requesting, an application support analyst too. Right now we do have one position in 911 um, who is a, he's a solutions analyst, a solutions analyst. Um, and bless his heart, he works 24-7. <laughs> he, uh, he is our gold mine, um, but we do work him a lot. So we have a lot of technology in 911 that serves um, not just 911, but all of public safety, and um, he, he's just very overworked. So we have uh, requested, we've worked with IS, we've requested this position, and we do plan on funding it out of um, 911 specifically because this is gonna be solely um, appointed and to 911. Um, we've also requested an admin specialist three. You know, I have one admin position right now. It's an admin coordinator that's assigned to me, um, but I do have three deputy director positions. So we're we're uh, requesting an admin specialist three to support those three deputy director positions, along with the technical services division. That's my personnel ask total of 3.7 million. So. I imagine you might be sitting there asking is, we have such a personnel increase, but we have such a small operating increase, how does that work? Well, 
Um, we do uh, try to be fiscally responsible with our E-901 fund. So we have thoroughly combed through our budget, especially even, um, prior to me, me getting here, but also since I have gotten here, we have thoroughly combed through uh, the budget and we've been able to save quite a bit of money um, in contracts. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, I have increased the training budget, the in-house training budget, the training and travel budget, and the education and training materials budget by quite a lot. The training budget by 87,000, the education and training materials by 63,000. We were really lacking in that area, um, but with also the increase in personnel that, um, that was kind of how we accounted for that. So we saved money in professional services by um, with the new quality assurance program that we implemented. We were able to negotiate with the priority dispatch company and locked in a rate for three years. And so we were able to reduce that by uh, $44,000. Um, I just wanted you to, to see it here just so you can see that we have been fiscally responsible with this fund. Uh, we've reduced our wireless and portable telephone service fund by $2,223. And then our total annual maintenance, um, the new technology initiatives that we have implemented, um, it comes down to a reduction of about 60% in that, uh, that annual maintenance and support fund. So we're pretty proud of that reduction. So our total operating request is only $31,420. So I threw this slide up here because more for perspective than anything, 911 has changed so much over the years. No longer are we the 911 of yesterday where we just had one incident and one call from a landline phone. 85% of our calls now are wireless 911 calls, cellular calls. I won't even tell you how many of those are butt dials because that's a whole other conversation. But <laughs> just had to throw, it's a long day. I had to throw, had to throw in some sarcasm there, but that's a true story though. Um, today, we, uh, we have so many wireless calls, one incident with multiple calls. If we get a call on the interstate, for example, mm -hmm. we have multiple people calling 911. That's very interesting. The next generation 911 that we call it, or NG 911 for short, is going to be extremely tech savvy. Um, it's extremely fast paced. And while we say that's the 911 of tomorrow, that really is also today. here today. And that is one incident with multiple calls, with text to 911, with pictures, with video, with live stream, lots of data. Now we do not have um, pictures or video or live stream messaging right now, but we do have text to 911. So again, in perspective, right now it takes about a minute and 38 seconds to process through a 911 call. With text to 911, it's about three times that amount. As much as we advertise for text to 911, our text to 911 calls are still very, very um, small in comparison with our voice over calls because again, we would prefer that people do call 911 instead of text, even though text is available to them in um, for dangerous situations and if they are unable to call 911. But video is coming. Mm -hmm. Picture messaging, live stream video is coming. Mm -hmm. um, we do work clo closely with the police department and we're, and we're hoping to have some involvement in their real-time crime center. Uh, we do get flock hits through the 911 center, so there's a lot of data that we are also involved in. Chief Johnson mentioned about the accreditation and how they're a data-driven organization, and they do rely on 911 a lot for that data as well. Mm -hmm. So we are very proud that we are one of the um, leading in the metro Atlanta areas, especially actually really in the 911 industry. We prefer to not compare ourselves with other agencies uh, for a reason, because we are truly leading the industry, especially in the metro Atlanta area, in leadership and innovation, um, and we are, we are certainly proud of that fact, and, and we want to continue to set the example here and, and lead forward. Next slide. Um, I also wanted to throw this up here for perspective because this is our fund balance. Um, so these are audited numbers. At the end of 2020, we had $10,600,000 in our fund balance. So that's over and above what we actually have in our, what we have budgeted for. Um, we do, we have seen, as you can see, an increase over the last couple of years of a couple of million dollars gone up over the years. And this is also, I ha again, it's, it's truly unheard of and, and something we're very proud of. Um, but it also says to me too, the reason why I'm asking for 44 total positions is that this department has been deprived in staffing in the last several years because that, that fund balance is, says a lot. It does say a lot. 
I have a lot of colleagues across the country who are rather jealous about that fund balance. So um, I will also say that our 911 dispatchers are just some of the some of the best trained in the state. Um, they work a lot of overtime. They get a lot of annual leave denied. Um, so we're looking to alleviate some of that for them by compensating them and also providing them with some extra staffing. Next. I thought I had a one-time capital. Did I not have a one-time capital? That was it. I had no capital. That was 800. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity. Any questions? Thank you. So I believe both um, Chief Kreider and, and Chief Johnson spoke about the um, shared program with um, providing support for those with um, mental health issues in the yes. field. I know that your department has also been a partner and is looking to be even more so. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, yeah. um, we sure can. We, we do get quite a lot of um, mental health calls. Um, and what we're looking to do, and, and this is also something that we have requested um, with the Cobb Community Services Board um, to possibly fund through ARPA, um, is to house a licensed clinician inside 911. Now that's not going to change the service from 911. We will still receive those calls and okay. we will still send emergency responders. Um, but we are also hoping that um, housing a licensed clinician inside 911 will help triage the call, um, help provide additional support for that individual, um, help the emergency responders, um, you know, go into the to the scene with um, a little bit more um, history on the on the individual and basically provide them with additional support services. Um, so we do have the console inside 911, and it's just a matter of um, training them up on how to use our computer system. Um, so yeah, so we're we're hoping to do that. Now we know that the the federal mandate of the additional nine nine eight eight service. We have uh, assessed that a great deal because I get a lot of questions about how is that going to help 911, and it's always going to help 911. Is it going to reduce 911 calls? I can tell you that it's it's not going to, um, at least for the next 10 to 15 years, simply because it's going to take that long to advertise um, that phone number. Mm -hmm. In addition, what I predict, and this is a, a respectful uh, opinion, what I predict is that a lot of those calls are still going to come through 911 and be transferred to 988 okay. when it happens. So yes, we are, we are working pretty closely with the fire department with their COBS um, care and PATH program. We're pretty pretty proud of that. We're trying to, uh, we're calling it alternative dispatch programs. Mm -hmm. It seems to be the trend in 911 centers now. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate your presentation. I know you've done a lot being on board for all of how many months, but six. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. And I'll just make one comment in addition to what she said about the clinician in 911. Obviously, because of HIPAA laws, uh, mm -hmm. we are not privy to a patient history, if you will when that call comes into the 911 center. So therefore, our responders have no idea what they're responding to, but by having this clinician in 911 okay, who sense. has access to that That's patient's perfect. history, mm -hmm. then without violating HIPAA laws, they can better direct the dispatch, the response, mm -hmm. and our, our responders at least know when they get there that you're dealing with someone that has a history. And I think it'll be a much more adequate uh, response than what we have typically done in the past because let's face it you know someone's uh, experiencing some type of mental illness uh, a lot of times even a uniform escalates that yes. and so uh, we just we just want to be very strategic in how we respond and I'm telling you more than ever we're experiencing in public safety uh, those types of challenges because of what people have been through yeah. over the past couple of years That's so Commissioner Brawl. Yes. Um, the additional requests for positions and equipment, is, is that um, in addition to the, the budget or the funding through the $1.50 cell phone fee? Yeah, because what was, what was isn't unique? Isn't that department fully funded by the $1.50 fee or not? Yes. 
Yes, everything that she, she put up on the screen, the 15 million that was revenue, that's using the dollar 50. You can imagine what it's going to go to if that increases to two dollars per phone. So the, the gist of what she was saying is, is that $10 million of fund balance is, is there because of how much we've been understaffed and not spent mm -hmm. that money and it's gone into fund balance. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what she was presenting there was is yes, what she collects on the 911 cell phone fees creates all of that budget for her. Okay. But will it, is it definitely oh, yes. going to $2? No, 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 not for sure. But what she presented here mm -hmm. would be funded with the current dollar fifty per phone. Okay, so yes, she's good. Yes, <laughs> her 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 revenues would support her request. Okay, very good. All right. Thank you. Appreciate everyone being here today and sharing with us your budget request. And we know there's a lot for us to get through, but it's very helpful to understand what it is we need to get through it. Sure. And so these presentations are very important to us. And here again, we'll be reaching out to your assistants probably after the first of the year to start scheduling some of those conversations where we can get down into the weeds. If, if you choose okay. to ask those questions, we'll be happy to answer those for you then. Thank okay. you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you, Derek. With that, our work session is um, officially closed for today. Thank you for joining us.